Hey everybody, John Locke here from the Meredith Public Library, coming back at you once again with yet another episode of What's Mr. John Reading? The show where we take a look at a stack of books right off my shelves. Uh, so if you missed the last uh, episode, you'll be excited to find out that we are back in the Meredith Public Library and we have access to those stacks, uh, not just for these videos, but you at home. Uh, we are open for curbside pickup, so give us a call. We're uh, run and pick up uh, every weekday. So um, if you have stuff you want, place a hold. We put it together for you, uh, safe and easy, pick it up outside off the table. Uh, it's really great. But we also have access to the stacks for these videos, which is even more exciting for me. Um, so today we're going to do a video that is going to be rated N for non-fic. Uh, non-fiction books. Um, I realize I really haven't uh, done a video on non-fiction books, which is ridiculous because that's for my youth collections, that's just about half the circulations are nonfiction. Um, so this is a, a really important category that I have overlooked, which is why we're going to try to cram a ton of books in today. So let's jump right in. All right, so my first one is a new book called Bringing Back the Wolves, How a Predator Restored an Ecosystem. Uh, so this is the story that uh, takes place in Yellowstone National Park. Um, what happened was uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, this was mostly farming land out here in the Midwest, cattle, really, um, uh, so it was ranching land. Um, and wolves obviously were a major predator. So the uh, United States government put bounties uh, on the gray wolf and you could make a lot of money hunting gray wolves. And unfortunately, within 50 years, they had uh, hunted them to extinction in this part of the United States. There were no more gray wolves uh, around Yellowstone. And what we discovered in the ensuing century was just how important they were to the ecosystem. This book really goes over you know, how they affected the whole food web, but that that affected you know, with more grazing animals because the wolves aren't eating the big bison, they're eating all the grass. So you know, there's much more uh, you know, mudslides were occurring, rivers were changing courses, and it just uh, massive changes um, that occurred when these uh, apex predators were hunted to extinction. Um, I also love this book because it's just, it's beautiful, really well illustrated, these great, um, they almost look like watercolor, uh, illustrations. I'm not sure how, how Kim Smith does it, but it's a, it's a really beautiful book. You're going to enjoy it too. Um, and it's going to, I, I think, get you thinking about national parks. They're really a, a, a great American treasure. Um, I have a series called the National Park Explorers um, that cover all the national parks, uh, and there's even one on Yellowstone. Um, this is a great series, Amazing Animals. These are just beautiful, beautiful photography. Uh, and we have one on foxes, which are a, a major part of this, bringing back the wolves, how they fit into the ecosystem with the foxes uh, was a big part of it. So we have that book on foxes. If you want something a little more entertaining, I love the What If You Had Animal Blank series. Um, gray, uh, gray wolves come up in the animal feet, the way their feet help them in the snow. Um, but this is great. There's What If You Had Animal Hair? What If You Had Animal Eyes? There's really a lot of cool um, different books. So they talk about the, the, the kind of fun, interesting parts of animals, and it's really interesting, fun series. Um, this is a great picture book, The Camping Trip That Changed America. This is the story of Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir, an early conservationist, and they took a trip across the United States and, and saw all these beautiful natural wonders that we had to offer. And that was what led to the creation of our national park system. So again, this is a really cool story. Um, it's a really entertaining book, really beautifully drawn. Kind of reminds me of a Stephen Kellogg, but it's not. But it's that sort of style of illustration, that Americana sort of style of illustration. Really love it. Um, and I wanted to sneak a fiction book in here too. I've already talked about this one in another video, but it is A Wolf Called Wander. Uh, and this is a fictionalized tale of an actual wolf that had been tagged in the Pacific Northwest and how it was driven from its pack and then traveled all over, you know, into California, parts of California that hadn't seen wolves. Again, they had been hunted to extinction. So this wolf traveled to parts of America that hadn't seen wolves in 50 to 75 years. A really interesting, fun story, but again, based on a real wolf that, that lived. So that was uh, Bringing Back the Wolves was our first book. All right, what's up next? We've got, uh, of course, these go, books go out like crazy. The National Geographic Kids Almanac 2021 here is the cover, great cover there with the, uh, I suppose that's a Jaguar or something, I'm not quite sure. Um, but these, National Geographic is, is a publisher that I, I, I know I can go to, both that the information will be factual, um, but also that um, the illustrations will be wonderful. I mean, it's National Geographic, they have major photography awards. This is, um, you're gonna get good photos out of this. Um, and as a librarian, I also really like that these are solid books. These are good, um, well put together hardcover books. Um, think about National Geographic with their almanacs. They don't go the full, huge almanac size. They're a little smaller. Those really hold up better in the long term. Um, so these, I'm going to have more National Geographic stuff on the shelf 
over time than I will for other books that only come out in paperback, where after a year of heavy use, they're, they're out the window. So I'm not going to have the 2021, 2020, 19, 18. Um, for other titles, but these National Geographic kids hold up really well. So you're going to see a lot more of these on the shelf at your library. Um, but I love these these almanac style books. Um, I loved them when I was a kid, and and they're great. Uh, still, kids love them. Um, I have the fantastic millennial facts. So this is lists, you know, lists of top this and that. Um, these are a lot of fun and a lot of great photography as well. Um, where on Earth? This is a really good one. This is more um, of an atlas. So we're going to see a lot of really interesting. Um, maps that are going to show not just, you know, borders where countries are, but um, where different uh, um, ge geographic phenomena have occurred, um, as, you know, farming, where things grow, animals, just really interesting maps. So if you, if you have a kid that really likes maps, pick up where on earth. There's also when on earth, um, which is more of, a, you know, showing through time um, how things have changed. Also very interesting. But these are more atlas uh, style almanacs. Um, we've also got the true or false. This one's a lot of fun. This gets into some of the more uh, trivia stuff that kids love. And then finally, we would, <laughs> wouldn't would be a list of almanacs if I didn't have a Guinness World Record in here. And of course, the most popular book right now is the Gamers Edition. Um, this is hugely popular. And unfortunately, it's a paperback. So this is not going to last long. Check it out while you can. All right, so that is the uh, National Geographic Kids Almanac 2021. What do we have next? We've got uh, we're getting into our cool, creepy stuff. This is Monstrous, the lore, gore, and science behind your favorite monsters. Uh, so this goes you know, through all the different kinds of monsters we see on the cover here, your Bigfoots, your, uh, your Frankenstein's monster, your Godzilla's. Um, it'll, it goes over you know, the history of pop culture, maybe where the monster came from. Uh, but then it covers you know, what, is, what is Bigfoot maybe actually based on? What are some real animals? Um, it goes through. Um, you know, the history of, you know, Frankenstein's monster is, is a fictionalized tale. So it kind of goes to the history of that too. So this is a great book because we, you know, it's a really fun cover, draws you in, and it talks about all these cool monsters, so kids love it. Um, but it touches a lot of different nonfiction topics along the way. Um, you're, you're touching you know, fiction, you're touching um, you're more natural things. Uh, really interesting book that's going to get kids interested in a lot of different things after they're drawn into monstrous. Um, so this topic is hugely popular um, at this age range. So I've got a tons of books on creepy things, tales of cryptids, mysterious creatures that may or may not exist. Uh, this is done sort of uh, in the style of a you know circus sideshow act. So I, I love the aesthetics here, um, and it, again it touches more of the uh, the the things that may have actually naturally existed. You got your Bigfoot, you got your Loch Ness monster. What might they be based on? The stories behind um, people that have looked for them. Um, really interesting stuff there. We've also got the Encyclopedia Horrifica. Uh, this is a really cool, gross book. Um, it's got a nice holographic cover too, which I love. Any book with a holographic cover is popular. Uh, the Monsterology book. This is a whole series. There's Spyology, Dragonology, Wizardology. A ton of these. Again, hugely popular. Not a librarian's best friend because these are the books that come with lots of little inserts, little maps and keys and things that go into different pockets, which inevitably, inevitably disappear and you have to pull the book off the shelf because it's missing half its content. Um, but they're still super popular, so I keep them on the shelf. I do what I can. I've you know, had many copies that have had to condense down into one because I've lost so many of the things, uh, but we do our best to keep those on the shelf. And really popular, Monster Arms was this one. Um, Gruesome Guide to World Monsters. This one's really interesting. It's done in the style of a travel guide. Uh, so that one's kind of cool, but it's also, it hits a lot more monsters like this. There's a new monster every page, and this is hundreds of pages. So we're hitting, um, you know, sort of folk tale and mythology from around the world that you're not going to see in a lot of other places. And this is a, a great way, again, for to, to pull kids in um, with a you know kind of creepy, gross cover. But they're going to get you know tales. You know, the the monsters in the mythology of South America are terrifying and crazy, like totally different from stuff that I've that I've seen. Um, in, in, in my local mythology here. Um, so that one's really cool. Speaking of kind of local mythology, I'm gonna sneak another fiction book in here, How to Catch a Boggle. Um, this is really great. This is a, a story of, uh, uh, they're, they're basically monster hunters. They, they catch them in Victorian England. Uh, so this is really entertaining. And again, it touches on lots of the um, folk tale and, and historical facts, but this is a, a really exciting um, fictional book here. But I like this book because what a boggle is, it's sort of a catch-all term for um, the, the monsters that basically the parents came up for. 
you know, a boggle would be hiding in, in, a, in a sewer drain or down by the river or under a bridge. Don't go down there. The boggle's hiding there. And these are stories that were made up to keep children safe, basically. You know, don't go hanging out down by the sewers. Don't go in that fast-moving river. Um, so these stories that were, that were created um, and then told in Bez bedtime stories to keep kids safe, ostensibly, but um, creates this really uh, wonderful tapestry of, of storytelling along the way. And I love it because this, I, my dad had a boggle story for us growing up. We had an unfinished, unsafe dirt basement. So he said that there was a sack monster that lived in the basement, so we should not go down there. And he had a series of stories about the sack monster who would come and grab boys and girls and stuff them into a sack and take them away. And, and, and he, again, he called it a sack monster, but really what it was, it was a boggle tale. Um, and this is something that parents have been doing with their kids for generations. So a really cool story, a really cool idea, too, of generational storytelling through, um, you know, safety <laughs> really cool stuff. So Monstrous is a great book. Kids love these books and they're going to get them interested in lots of different topics along the way. So um, don't be don't be concerned if your child brings home a, a kind of gross looking book because it's still it's still a book. We still like it. All right. Up next, we got uh, in my YA section of the stack. Uh, this is thank you for coming to my TED Talk, a teen guide to great public speaking. So my basic direction with my YA nonfiction collection is self-improvement. Teenagers, I mean, the, this is a great time in someone's life to level up those skills. You know, you're about to be out um, to, to face your, 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 the real world, so to speak, the main quest in your video game of a life. So get those skills leveled up. Um, get yourself rounded and, 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 and ready to go. And so my YA collection really reflects that. So we've got a lot of self-improvement books, I'm a lot of, uh, but also about self-realization and self-actualization, not just, you have to know who you are before you know, um, you know, where you want to grow or what, where your strengths are. You have to kind of realize who you are. So a lot of these books are kind of about that. Um, I've also got the Confidence Code for Girls. This is really popular. Um, taking risks, messing up, and becoming your amazingly imperfect, totally powerful self. Um, super, I, 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 I read half of it. I know it says for girls, but I also read Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, when I was in third grade. So, I mean, books for boys, books for girls. What's the matter? Um, next, we have Choose to Matter, Being Courageously and Fabulous, Fabulously You. Um, this is from the ESPNW imprint. Um, so this is um, written by a gold medalist. So this kind of comes at this sort of um, self-actualization, self-improvement from an athlete's point of view. Um, which in, which intrigues me. I think there are a lot of a lot of student athletes out there that get to the end of high school and and don't quite know what they're going to do next. So um, being able to have an in um, with a book like this written by um, a two-time Olympic gold medalist is pretty great. Uh, I've also got Quiet Power: The Secret Strengths of Introverts, adopted for kids and teens from the groundbreaking bestseller Quiet by the same author uh, or authors. Um, so don't don't. Be afraid to be an introvert. I think a lot of people are pretty surprised to find out I, I, I am an introvert. I was a really quiet kid. Um, I got into theater and that got me out of my shell and that's why I am the talkative guy I am today. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of introverts out there and it's not a weakness, it's just a different strength. Um, so uh, books for introverts are, are right up my alley and I really like this one. Uh, and then finally we have The Year of Yes. This is by Shonda Rhimes, um, who you may know she's uh, written, created and written the TV shows um, uh, scandal, Grey's Anatomy, How to Get Away with Murder. Um, so this is her year of yes, how to dance it out, stand in the sun, and be your own person. Um, really fun. This is a, a more of a book of like sort of daily affirmations, um, but uh, really great. And again, when you've got these pop culture figures that that a that a teen might um, already be aware of and be more comfortable, that's a great way um, to get these books into their lives um, when you have kids that might need them. So what I'm thinking, though, with, with self-improvement, I mean, one of the major skills that, that I didn't have coming out of my teenage years that I think is important for kids is cooking, being able to feed yourself. Uh, so I've got a ton of cookbooks, uh, everything from, you know, a basic ballpark eats. Uh, so this is just, you know, grilled food and sides. This is all based on different. So we've got different ballparks that they'll go over where the different recipes have been adapted from. Um, so this is really great uh, to get young kids into basic food. Um, but then my guy, when it comes to food, is Alton Brown. He's taught me um, more than any other uh, person when it comes to food. So I have uh, his cookbooks as well. 
including I'm just here for the food. Food plus heat equals cooking. Um, so again, teenagers, this is a great time to, to, to improve yourself, to get those skills up to snuff, um, to, to fill in the gaps where you think you might have them and to build on your strengths. So my, my YA collection really reflects that. I think that's something um, that, that teenagers are looking for. They're looking for, for ways to grow and the ways to understand themselves and the world around them um, through gaining skills. Uh, and reading books like this is a great way to, to gain some life skills before they uh, hit their main quest. All right, so that is, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Up next, we've got Build Yourself Happy. Uh, did anybody else watch the Lego Masters show on Fox, hosted by Will Arnett? I watched every episode of that thing religiously. It was uh, terrific. I love Lego. And that just that show was just so happy. It reminded me how happy Lego is, um, both as an activity and really as a brand. They do a, have done a good job of, of being inclusive um, over the years. But Build Yourself Happy, this is um, a book really about uh, meditation and mindfulness through Lego building. Uh, Lego... I always say with the kids, like they, kids love, you know, collecting different cool pieces, but then building things with them. I love searching for pieces. So when I'm playing Legos with a kid, I'm, you know, Mr. John, I need a brick, a brick this size, this color, and I love looking for it. There's something about sifting and hunting through a giant pile of Legos that does something to my brain that is really relaxing and calming. So I love that aspect of Legos. But the thing is about Legos, there's so many of those aspects that can be really relaxing and, um, and, and peaceful and self-beneficial. Uh, so um, Lego, I'm a big fan. Definitely pick up Build Yourself Happy, um, especially these days when we need more things in our life that are calming and, and, and helpful. Uh, definitely pick that up. But yeah, I've got a ton of Lego books in the collection. Um, I love this Lego Ideas book. This is all uh, fan-done creations. So none of these were from any instruction booklet that, that, was, that came in a box. This is uh, all fan design. This is really interesting. Um, I also recommend the Lego book. If you're gonna get serious about your Legos and wanna learn your Lego terms, Princess, do you know what uh, a snot technique is? Studs not on top. So anytime you're building where the bumps aren't pointing up, that's a snot technique. The bumps are pointing down or sideways. Um, so there's lots of really cool lingo like that. Learn different pieces have different names, like different slopes have different names. Um, it's just really kind of fun and it's really dorky, but I, I, it's a really interesting part of Lego to me. Um, and then as always, the Lego visual dictionaries are hugely popular. I've got the Star Wars one, I've got the Harry Potter one, I got a ton of these. Um, they just, they go out like crazy. I've got to replace them constantly. These are solid books, but they are so popular, they get beat up. Uh, let's see what else do I have. So Cult of Lego, this is in my YA collection as well. This is more of the story of uh, the culture around Lego, the, the popularity of it, um, and how it's kind of permeated our culture and become part of the zeitgeist. So that's a really interesting read um, if, you're, if you're more of a cultural historian and you want to look at that part of Lego. Uh, and then finally, I've got Brick Flicks, a comprehensive guide to making your own stop motion Lego movies. I love stop motion anyway. I'm a big, you know, Wallace and Gromit fan. So it's a great um, animation style. But really these days, it's easy to do. Most kids are going to have a device in their pocket that are capable of creating these stop motion video. And all they need are the Legos and then all your theatrical pieces, your, your backgrounds, your lights, that sort of thing. Um, so this is much more uh, uh, attainable than I think many people think it is. You can probably do it with your phone, with a free app. Um, with the Legos you have lying around and maybe like a desk lamp so it's well lit. You can do a stop motion brick flip from your house this afternoon, uh, but maybe start with this book, pick up some tips. All right, so finally we have The Fire Never Goes Out. This is a graphic memoir, or as she calls it, a memoir in pictures, uh, by Noelle Stevenson. So Noelle Stevenson, if you don't recognize that name, uh, she wrote Nimona, which is maybe my favorite graphic novel from the last five years, certainly one of the top. Uh, really interesting reversal of, you know, good guy, bad guy, fairy tale tropes here. Uh, she's also written the uh, series Lumberjanes. This is about a supernatural girls summer camp. Uh, really entertaining. Uh, and she is currently the showrunner for the Netflix adaptation of She-Ra. Uh, so she's really stepping up in the world, doing a lot of cool things. And The Fire Never Goes Out is, is her story um, told in her pictures about, you know, getting to where she is and what it's like being, being her. A really entertaining graphic memoir is, is a really booming uh, 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 subgenre right now. We've got a ton of them. Uh, books like Hyperbole and a Half by Ali Brosh and Big Bushy Happy Lump 
by Sarah Anderson. Uh, these were both, um, both of these uh, uh, cartoons got their start with web comics. Um, so these are their, you know, web comics, and then it becomes, big, becomes bigger, and they get to tell their story um, through their through their art. Hyperbole and a Half is a little more words and a little less art, and Big Mushy Happy Lump is more art, less words. So a little more, a little different balance there. Uh, up now we have Dark Knight: A True Batman Story. This book is amazing. Um, this is written by Paul Dini, illustrated by Eduardo Risso. Uh, Paul Dini, uh, if you don't recognize the name, is possibly the most influential Batman writer of all time. He was the main writer for the 90s Batman the Animated Series, which I think when a lot of people think of Batman, that's one of their earliest memories from, from my generation. You know, we've got the, the, uh, the, the, the silly movies, and then we've got this kind of reintroducing him as a serious character through Batman the Animated Series. Um, great voice acting there. That's Mark Hamill got it, uh, doing the Joker in the Batman the Animated Series. But yeah, so Paul Dini was the main writer and he had done comic books. So this is, he was really blowing up and becoming popular and, and rich and famous. And, and, and at the height of all of his powers here, you know, Batman the Animated Series is one of the top shows on TV. He is attacked on the way home and mugged and brutally beaten and left for dead and hospitalized for a long time. And while he was recovering in the hospital, recovering from serious brain injuries, he started hallucinating his Batman characters. On days when he's not doing so well and, and he thinks this is it and I'm going to die, he would see the Joker standing next to his bed laughing at him about how he can't handle it, how he can't do this, how he's never going to get through. And on days maybe when he's, when he's feeling tougher, he feel like he can make it through. He'd see, I mean, he's hallucinating and seeing Batman standing in the corner watching him just silently all day and it changed his life obviously he recovered and, and he's okay now um but the whole experience both the 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 trauma itself and the oddness of his recovery here by seeing the characters really changed his view on life and so he wrote dark knight a true batman story where he kind of re-examined his life and his story up until this point through this lens of what if these superheroes that i write for every day were actually here, what would they say to me? What would they think of my life? Um, really interesting story, beautiful art. Um, is, I, I learned a lot about the, the, the Batman the Animated Series just sort of um, by getting interested through this book and then I looked more stuff up. Um, that's the beauty, I think, of, of nonfiction here to kind of step back at, towards the end of the video is that nonfiction, you can pick up a book and you don't necessarily have to read the whole thing to get a lot out of it and it's going to get your mind interested in in other parts um of, of our history or of our planet and so nonfiction is is really it's it's a it's a it's a it's a branch it's a way to to branch out from our normal way of reading and to read lots of different things you're going to get interested in different parts of the world um and so i that's one of the reasons that i i always keep a nonfiction book in rotation is that it keeps me curious and interested in things. Um, and that's just a great mindset to be in. I think curiosity is a very important human trait that we should really um, try to nurture in ourselves. So read more nonfiction, it's gonna get you curious. All right, our final book, our final graphic uh, memoir uh, just came out really important um, to our time and things that are happening in the United States right now. They Called Us Enemy by George Takei. Uh, George Takei, if you do not know, played um, Mr. Sulu in the original Star Trek TV series, but recently has become a really outspoken um, advocate for, for human rights is really what it boils down to. So this is his story. Um, uh, Takei uh, is Japanese American uh, and he grew up uh, in the forties. And when, during World War II, he was along with his family and thousands of other Japanese Americans forcefully removed from their homes and relocated to internment camps where they were held by U.S. military uh, for, an, for the, the entirety of the war, basically, and for a little bit afterwards as well. Um, a really, really sad, traumatic point in our history and something that um, we kind of seem to have forgotten and, and isn't being considered um, when we look at what's going on right now in our country. We need to remember just how terrible um, stuff like this is and, and not repeat it, not let this happen again like it is. So this is a, a really powerful book, um, really important, and a, a something that I think we need to, everybody needs to read. We need this reminder um, 
uh, that this is not good. This is not okay to treat American citizens um, as they were treated here. Uh, so that is They Called This Enemy, written by George Takei. Uh, and that is our final book for, the, for today. All right, thanks so much for watching once again. Uh, I have a lot of fun making these videos, and I hope you enjoy watching them. So click a like, maybe uh, share it, uh, and uh, look forward to more. There will be more, Mr. John, in the future. All right, everybody, thanks so much. Have a great day. Be kind to yourself, and uh, be kind to someone else today, too. All right, bye.